Now in getting to the point that I finally want to get to, I hope I have convinced you to stop with your ancestral worship guys because it will be very soon, very soon. I am not speaking years from now or decades. I'm speaking weeks, weeks, at most months. People are because the Lord is delivering his church from the darkness. Now let's get to the thing that God was showing me about the way that people who are busy mixing Jesus with ancestral worship are thinking. They're looking at the true body of Christ, people who are truly consecrated to Jesus and how it is that they appear to have no answered prayer. In God's word, in the book of Thessalonians, and even in the book of Romans, the Lord speaks about how he deals with people that don't believe the truth, that don't want to take what they understand to be the truth inherently. In Romans 1, the Lord says that people who disregard him and his whole word as fact, you are without excuse because of the invisible qualities of God. I have just described them. No need to highlight them. All the obviousnesses that I've highlighted highlighted in my previous parts are those invisible qualities of God over and above the fact that you have a conscience your conscience you 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 feel uncomfortable when you do bad stuff all right when you sit around in those obviousnesses and you ignore them according to is it first or second Thessalonians and first Romans 1 God has this thing that he does where he lets you continue to believe a lie because you have refused to acknowledge an obvious truth a truth that is stark and clear in your face you have chosen to disregard it now i have a cousin that the lord has shown me is thinking currently why would god choose me over karab the thing it do me in her mind all day every day is why did god choose me over karab and why would god choose me over karab do you know why she's thinking that because she understands her deeds as being inherently evil she went to asangoma to afflict my future and she got everything that she ever asked for in prayer and now today she is confused as to why god chose her over me due to her comprehension of my right standing with god at least in comparison to her she knows i have never succumbed or subscribed to ancestral worship to demonic worship to also turning to the darkness to get my day in court and even though initially when she was running after these things she thought quick win microwave baby instant gratification now today she's getting attacked by fear the fear of which is questioning why would god choose karabo over me and like i said the thing that's making her ask that question is karabo has obviously stuck to jesus and i have tarried from jesus in a way that has made me uncomfortable but Karabo is going nowhere and she's doing nothing. She is finished off. My curse appears to have worked on her. She's lost all of her 30s. Why would God choose me over Karab? Why? Why would God choose to give me a future and not Karab? That is logic operating. Invisible qualities of God. It's logic. It's she's stuck to Jesus and I haven't. Why would God choose her? Me, sorry, over her. Exactly. If thoughts like those don't make you repent, what God does as is what he spoke about in his word in Romans 1 and 1 and 2 Thessalonians, one of the two of the Thessalonians, I believe it's actually 1 Thessalonians 4. The Lord knows that people in the last days, this is, guys, this one I believe is also in 1 Timothy 4. In the last days, people will not endure sound doctrine. And so in having itching ears, will gather for themselves a great number of teachers to tell them what they want to hear. They will gather for themselves a great number of teachers to teach them what their itching ears want to hear. And for this reason, God will hand them over to their debased minds so that they can believe the lie for had they have not loved the truth, but have rather taken pleasure in their unrighteousness. In Romans 1, God says that these people not only know that their deeds are not good and they yield no good fruit, but they not only continue to do them, but they also praise those who walk in them and they encourage them to walk in them. Again, the Lord says that for this reason, God hands them over to their passions. He just lets them be. When you do not love the truth, but take pleasure in your unrighteousness, the Lord sends, this here then is in 1 Thessalonians or 2, I stand corrected, a strong delusion so that you will continue to embrace the lie 
So what is this strong delusion if at all we are yet to reach Antichrist days in the, in, in the tribulation? A strong delusion looks like Christian persecution that is left unfettered by the God of the universe. It looks like Christians getting no answered prayer while the wicked get answered prayer. A strong delusion looks like the massacring of saints while there is no intervening God on behalf of the saints. And what it does, the reason why it's a delusion is because people then walk in a mindset that God would obviously have rescued Karabo if she was right. Whereas the Lord has made it clear in his word that in the last, not in the last days only, but that if anybody wants to live a life in godliness, they will suffer persecution. He also said in the Beatitudes that blessed are the persecuted, that men will revile you and call you all different kinds of things on account of his name. And on that day, your reward in heaven is great. He says that if anybody loses their life, this is now in one of the gospels. If anybody loses their lives, they will gain it. If anybody loses their life for the sake of the kingdom of heaven, they will gain their, those lives. But if anybody holds on to their lives, they will lose their lives. It is also written again in the gospels that anybody who has left mother, father, brother, fields, children, lands for the sake of the kingdom of heaven will in this life gain all of those things in 100 fold with persecutions and in the next life, eternal life. So we are guaranteed suffering. God also says in his word, no one who puts his hand to the plow and then looks back is fit to enter the kingdom of heaven. The Lord knows therefore that people would want to look back and it is those who look back like Lot's wife who will get turned into a pillar of salt. They're not fit for the kingdom of heaven. So when you enter into Christianity, you say the sinner's prayer and then you look back at your former ways or you look at ancestors or any other alternative thing, you're in trouble. You're in trouble. God gave us the fruit of patience and of long suffering precisely because we, we would need it. He made it clear that when you come to me, you're going to need, do you understand? Need patience. So I'm going to give it to you as a fruit of my spirit because you're going to have to wait while I handle people around you. It's also written in God's word that God has set apart everything for its purposes, including the wicked for the day of trouble. The wicked for the day of trouble is a person that rocks up and thinks in a very beastly manner. They ration like animals and they imagine that the tantamount of God's blessedness on their lives is the equivalent, I guess, tantamount of God's ignoring of anybody that is negatively speaking against them. So you ignore prophecy, you ignore God's daughters and sons who are bearing fruit for Jesus and they are enduring hardship and you equate that hardship as evidence of God's abandonment of them when the Lord has has rather given them patience to sit out such abandonment as that or what appears to be abandonment for he can never leave or forsake us. The Lord has given us everything that we need to live a life in godliness including waiting while just like with the story of Job your friends speak smack into your ear because apparently allegedly you must be forsaken given that you're not getting your day in court any minute now. Jesus Christ has made it clear that his saints are going to go through nonsense across the world and that when we go through the, this nonsense we must take heart for he has overcome the world. So if you ignore the Bible or you read it like a pamphlet and not the 66 word book you will fall under the beguiling of prosperity preaching where it is assumed that a person must therefore not be in Christ or blessed by God when they are going through a never ending or what appears to be a never ending cycle of harassment. They keep on getting tarnished by abuse and all their enemies are getting their day in court. Psalm 37, the same lament is, is vomited out by, I believe, Asaph, who says, why do the wicked prosper? Why is it that, like God says, fret not yourself over the ways of evildoers. He looks upon the wicked and how they just get sleek, they get fat. And he's like, but have I in vain stood by the truth? In vain did I stand with Jesus? In vain did I stand with God? Until Asaph wakes up and realizes that the wicked are thrown on slippery paths, that their end is, is calamity. But whom have I in heaven but you? Earth has nothing I desire besides you. The Old Testament and New Testament saints, many of their stories speak of a severe struggle initially 
where they are being mocked and jested and jeered at by those who surround them, who imagine themselves obviously favored by God because their lives are so good, but they stand, they fall, they stand, they suddenly fall. It's written in God's word that the wicked, the, the, sorry, that the righteous may fall seven times, but they get up each time while the wicked are suddenly overcome by calamity. So the sudden disappearance of the wicked and the sudden destruction of the wicked, that's what I'm trying to warn you is coming to you guys. For you have gotten fat and you have not loved the truth, but have rather taken pleasure in your unrighteousness. And you have despised those who do good. So 1 Timothy 3, despisers of good, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. Those who despise those who do good your calamity according to God's word is sudden whereas God says to us and I believe first or second Peter but I think it's first Peter 4 that we must not consider it strange when we go through trials of different kinds for this is a you know the testing of our faith we might be beleaguered on all sides but according to Psalm 91 a thousand falls on our left and ten thousand on our right but it does not come near us we are a covered and a protected people but we also are guaranteed suffering and what keeps us strong is recognition that God warned us of these things that when they happen we might believe and not lose faith not lose hope not lose heart not consider it strange not be perplexed as if though something weird was happening to us when we endure trials of different kinds the fiery darts of the enemy we have had them prophesied will come to us and so when they happen we hold up the shield of faith that we might not fall okay but you who are the vessel of bringing these fiery darts if you are into witchcraft when you get every last one of your prayers answered you are nothing but one of those men written of in SF's psalm that the wicked keep getting fat in vain did I give my life to God what's going on but then SF wakes up and realizes that they're put on slippery paths You've been given grace, God, a slow to anger, not abounding in steadfast, uh, abounding in steadfast love, not willing that anybody should perish, but that all should come to a knowledge of him. And that season of grace is for you to repent. You've been thrown truth in your general direction for years. Years. There are evidences, invisible qualities of God around my life that make it clear that the Lord has my back. But you've ignored and disregarded them because, oh my goodness, look at you walking around with all of your answered prayer. Rain falls on the wicked and on the righteous all the same. But it is the righteous that gets suddenly overtaken by a tsunami, by a flood. It is the righteous where the rain rains so much that it takes them away like a flood. Just like in the days of Noah, they were drinking, eating, being merry. And then all of a sudden, the flood came and swept them all away. So yeah, I get that rain might fall on the righteous and on the wicked. But it is only the wicked that get taken away by a flood. So, has it started to rain in your life? Has it been raining blessings? It appears the rain is never going to stop because it's going to take you away. And I'm trying to snatch, literally snatch, because right now you're facing hellfire as in two weeks from now. You from out of the flames. This here is an attempt to rescue you. I don't care about your guilt. God has shown me that you are guilty, but you are unrepentant. And I'm like, they're so typical because it's written in God's word that godly guilt leads to repentance, but worldly guilt leads to death. You're about to die in guilt guilt because you hope that upon me having no answered prayer you might just finish me off or get away with this or all of us clamp together in this darkness because i will finally join Mosangoma because that's what you're gunning for you want to recruit me for the for the darkness when i have this kind of mind first of all the mind of christ and i have tasted the things to come so you're trying to get me to blaspheme the holy spirit basically guys you're about to die like the calamity that suddenly comes on the wicked because you have not loved the truth but have taken pleasure in your unrighteousness god sent you me as a strong delusion this woman whose prayers are so unanswered she has asked for everything husband children all that jazz and she's still empty-handed today so my cousin's inquisition along the lines of why would god choose her over me exactly those are the kinds of thoughts you should be having run in your mind and hopefully those thoughts might actually lead you to jesus christ that god has not chosen you over garabo god has rather used garabo as a strong delusion against you made you believe that he's content with you consulting sangomas despite him making it clear in his word that he is jealous for you you shall have no other god but him while you get everything you want in prayer so Bosango, my this like uh, alternative spirituality of yours using it as you know uh, what what is this like a um not a substitute, but um, you know when you add something, uh, a supplement, thank you, a supplement to Christianity, where you supplement your faith with ancestral worship, that if at all God does not give you what you want, you're just going to give him a little bit of a nudge, help him out with ancestors. You think that God must approve 
of that because he has allowed Garabo to stay saddened. So therefore evidencing that God must be disquieted with people who don't acknowledge their ancestors. Though Those are the thoughts running in the minds of witches. They have successfully gotten away with all the murder they can commit and Christians are still languishing. And that is their theology, their doctrine, which is anathema. As th that confirms or validates that God must be content with ancestors. When rather, that's your strong delusion. Next part.